What's up, Investor Nation? Ryan Herding from iFund Cities. We're coming back with a special edition on how to replan 101. We've got two special guests. We've got Sean Pinkus from Grit Construction. You can check him out on Instagram at Bill Grit, I believe. Grit Bill, yeah. Grit Bill. And you got Tracy Brothers, Mike Tracy at Tracy Brothers Construction LLC. Um, and so today we got two things we're gonna cover. Sean's gonna cover his multifamily building on how to read plans, and Mike's gonna cover how to look at plans from a rehab perspective. Let's start with, with Sean and Grant, and we're gonna be talking about plans one-on-one today. So we're gonna start with how to read a how to read a basic plan. So your architectural, your mechanical, your structural, some things you might want to look at in the plan to help value engineer. Um, so with that, I'm gonna kick it over to the expert uh, with Sean and we can start it off. So Sean, I'm a new investor. I'm coming to you. I got these plans on, on, on the board here. We're talking about them, looking at them. It looks like Greek. How would you educate an investor uh, to look at kind of the first page of the plans? Because it, it's really the holy grail. If you guys don't know how to read the first page of the plans, you're gonna have a hard time uh, building your project and interfacing with your contractor. So with that, I'll kick it over to the expert. Cool, so uh, best place to start is, on these plans, it happens to be in the center, but it's with building square footage. So we have a lot of clients that come to us, a lot of investors that come to us, and the first question they ask is, what's the per square foot cost to build this? Uh, and that's a tough question in and of itself, but we gotta be making sure we're working from the same square footage, right? So this plan right here is 5,451 gross square feet. Um, and the reason I bring that up is it seems like a simple concept, but a lot of people, when they come to us and ask us for that number, they may be leaving out the basement square footage but that's part of the gross square footage. They may be leaving out pilot houses, they may be leaving out decks, things like that, uh, that are really gonna throw off your numbers compared to our numbers and really gonna, uh, it, it could just throw off the entire project if you're running this performa based on three to 2,000 square foot difference on a whole floor plate. So uh, we really start there and that, that's really helpful. The next step is... Let me interrupt one second. And that's why it's really important to have plans before you come to a contractor, at least some preliminary footprint, because you're going to ask them that number, and they're not going to be able to give you an accurate number without plans, right? And so plans are super important. So before you call a contractor and waste your time and their time, make sure that you have a set of plans, or you've talked to an architect, or you've put this team together up here of architect and builders, so you can start to have some framework to what this project's actually going to cost you. Let me jump in here real quick. So... Uh, in, in a way, yes, it is It is also great to have plans, but if you're also a new investor, you can call up an architect and he may not, you know, not our, all architects are created equal. So sometimes it is best to reach out to a GC and say, hey, listen, I'm interested in building this. Is there an architect that you recommend that can kind of help me through and, you know, we can kind of back plan. We can use somebody that we worked with before that can kind of steer you in the right direction. So you're not some guy comes and says, oh yeah, single family house, the architecture plan is 25,000, you know, like you can really get raked over the coals. It's a great point. So again, back to what we've talked about in all our segments, you've got to build relationships with these guys. Don't call them and ask them for a price. Call them and build long-term relationships with them, right? They're going to be there for you. They want to build long-term partnerships. That's really important. So first page, back to the first page. So um, here's your ledger on the side. Walk us through what A, C, S, E. Yeah, sure. Cool, so drawing list is usually on the first page of the cover sheet, legend at the bottom, CS cover sheet. All right, so you're usually gonna start with the architectural plans. The architectural plans are labeled with an A at the bottom, uh, and then the drawings are all broken out with what those uh, specific architectural drawings pertain to. So whether it be your wall types, your window schedule, your elevations, etc. The next set, which I don't have here with me, but would be your structural plans. Um, and those are gonna be labeled S. So instead of an A at your bottom, it'll say S. Um, and that's gonna be all your structural plans. So your foundations, your underpinning, your sheeting, your shoring, um, your framing, your shear walls. Uh, the next couple things are the MEPs that we talked about. So M being mechanical is gonna be all your mechanical drawings. E is gonna be all your electrical drawings. P is gonna be all your plumbing drawings. Uh, and then if you get the set, which normally doesn't come from the MEP engineer or the architect, it'd be the FP drawings which are usually your fire protection or your sprinkler drawings. And that usually have to get direct from the sub, but they are labeled FP for submission to the city. Thanks, Sean, for covering the first page. That was super awesome. Mike, we're gonna transition. We're gonna look at, go from a multifamily over to a rehab project. Um, obviously, it's the architectural plans here. Mike's gonna talk a little bit about a mistake that he found and why it's really important to have a competent builder who works with their architect, because people make mistakes. Shit happens, it's real estate. Um, so Mike, kick it off on a rehab project here. All right, so this is a small single family rehab. Um, this involves underpinning and a rear addition, two-story rear addition. 
Um, one of the things I noticed when first looking at the plans is that the architect, that we're adding a new seven feet foundation for the basement. So we're basically digging back the basement seven feet. Because that basement is going to be used as a bedroom, it has to have an egress well. Well, when the architect drew the plans, they actually added another four feet, which is only supposed to be on the second floor of where the egress well goes. So if you don't have somebody competent reading their plans, we just added another 11 feet to the basement, and now Ellen and I is going to come back out and make me either tear all this out and fill it back in um, or put a workstop order and make me amend the plans. So this is why it's very important to go over the plans before you start or before you hand them off to the sub to make sure that what is actually annotated on the plans is correct in each, uh, each segment of the drawing here. This is big in Philly. So a lot of guys on these rehab projects, they're trying to add square feet and so they're digging basements. So Mike, maybe talk a little bit about the cost of digging basements because it's awfully expensive for guys um, and to kind of what goes into it from an underpretty perspective. Um, I think it, I think a lot of investors just think, oh, you dig the basement and you got another bedroom, and that's there's way more to it. And it's way more complicated and it's expensive. Um, so one thing about underpinning is um, I will not underpin every project. Some houses are just it's too dangerous to underpin and it's too much of a risk. So basically, what underpinning is is that when you dig below the foundation, you actually remove dirt from underneath the foundation in segments. Uh, normally they're labeled uh, A, B, C, and D, but here they're labeled one, two, three, and four. So you remove the dirt from all the ones in the property. You fill concrete, you put a form underneath of it, so it basically extends that foundation down. Here on this one it says that we're gonna underpin three feet. The right way to do it is that you have to have a structural engineer sit on site, watch at every one, and have the concrete uh, pulled out, rebarred, and then filled back in. You're supposed to wait six days in between each underpinning section. This allows the concrete to dry and cure properly. So if we do our ones the one day, then we move and we do our twos six days later. Then six days later, we do our threes. Six days later, we do our fours. This ensures that the concrete is set up properly and that the building is not going to drop and collapse. Underpinning 101. Mike, give us a little bit of an idea of what kind of cost people were looking for and, so, and when and why they would actually underpin in a rehab project. Um, so in Philadelphia, um, to have a finished basement, a considered livable with space, I need 84 inches from finished floor to finished site, so seven feet. Um, and the reason that they do that is um, to put bedrooms or, or living space down there. If you are going to create a living space in a basement, i.e. bathroom or bedroom, you have to have an egress. Egress is in case there's a fire up on the first floor, there's a way to get people out um, of the basement. Um, now talking about underpinning price. Um, it depends on how far down we have to go. Um, if we're talking about underpinning six inches, it's obviously a lot cheaper than if we're underpinning three feet. Um, how do they determine whether it's six inches or three feet? So you do a test pit um, along the side of the foundation before anything starts. Normally done by the, the engineer um, who relay, relays that information to the architect and says this foundation only goes down so far in order to achieve that. So this one they're trying to achieve um, a ceiling height of eight feet. Um, so you know this one says we have to go down three feet in order to put our four inches of crushed stone and then our four inches of concrete in, in the bottom so that the, the bottom layer is um, nice and secure. Um, so it's important, I think, for investors who are trying to value engineer rehabs. Eight foot ceilings, a lot of guys I see try to squeeze rehabs in with these seven foot ceilings, seven, six. Really, you want an eight foot ceiling to give a comfortable living space and actually add value to the project. So from a lending perspective, we're looking at that, right? We're looking to Mike and we're looking to Sean to make sure that, that these guys help uh, well, you're, engineer you're trying to achieve the, not to feel like a basement you want it to feel like it's it's part of the home like it's that livable space that's why the, the light wells and the egresses are important so that you know you don't feel like you're in a subterranean dungeon you know when you want to feel like it's it's a livable space but not that you're going to get trapped down there as well 